Good morning, everyone. Welcome officially to worship at Emmanuel United Church of Christ, both in person and online, no matter how you are joining us. We are so glad that you are here. Today, we're talking about dancing. So whether or not you have your ballet shoes on or your toe tapping shoes or shoes that feel like lead, no matter who you are or how much you like to dance, you are welcome here. We uh, have a couple of announcements that I want to share with you. You may have noticed if you came in the parking lot door uh, that we have had another incident of broken glass. Um, and we are aware um, of who it is. Our cameras have uh, helped us know that it is somebody that we recognize and the same person that we think has caused the last three incidences of broken glass. So. I just wanted to assure you that we are working with the police, but we are also working with our WISE team and our leadership team. We're pretty sure this is a result of um, pretty severe mental illness. And uh, we want to be able to be as loving a presence as we can uh, with this person while also doing what we need to do to be responsible stewards of the building. And so we invite your prayers. It's a hard and sticky thing. Um, and that there's no easy answer, uh, but we really appreciate your prayers and appreciate all the ways that we try our best to love one another, even when it is hard. This is Vacation Bible School week, except actually it's the week of Vacation Bible School day. Uh, so we have had to change up the way it's going. Uh, the the post-pandemic world is different and uh, the, everything is different. Um, but we're going to have one day from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. I assume there's still spaces available. If you know someone who is ages four to uh, exiting fifth grade, um, who would like to hang out with us and some dragons on Wednesday of this week, contact Samantha, uh, who's back there or whose uh, email is on the website. General Synod also begins today. This is our uh, biannual, meaning every two years, uh, gathering of the entire United Church of Christ, except this year it's different. It's online. Um, and there are lots of difficulties with that situation, but one of the benefits of it is that all of us can participate in worship. And that starts at 5 p.m. today. If you search for United Church of Christ on YouTube, you will be able to participate on, in the uh, live worship service at 5 p.m. today. The preacher is Reverend Benjamin Chavez Jr., who is a civil rights activist um, who has 
been in the business a good long time uh, and probably has a great deal of wisdom. There is a live and open midweek worship service Wednesday at 8 p.m. And that preacher is Reverend Michelle Higgins, who is the pastor of St. John's UCC in St. Louis. And closing worship, and this is all in uh, your emailed bulletin and we'll promote it as much as we can. Uh, closing worship is next Sunday, July 18th at 6 p.m. And that is the Reverend Karen, Karen Georgia Thompson, who is the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries. So she's a bit of a grand poobah and uh, would be wonderful to hear, I'm certain. There will also be guaranteed to be great music, probably dancing, uh, and lots of other good stuff. So it's usually great worship, and we invite you to join in. We're going to continue our Bible study uh, at noon on Thursday right here and uh, join us if you would like. And if you want to come by Zoom, just let me know and we will get you a link. And our happy hour is still virtual and on this week at 4 p.m. Um, we are good right now for the little pantry. We don't need any more uh, things. So um, please find other ways to give. And one of those other ways, Sandra Riley is gonna come up and tell you about. Uh, so if you'd like to um, come on up, Sandra, and then uh, Pat will be our next announcement after that. Good morning, everybody. I am one of the representatives for a manual for the Brooklyn uh, Bellwood Auxiliary. And uh, we haven't met for over a year and a half. And tomorrow we have the opportunity to get together for the first time in a year and a half. We're going to be meeting right here in the manual. So anyone that's been curious about what the Brooklyn Auxiliary does or how we help the kids, We'd love to have you come with us. It's going to be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. One of the things that they ask us to start trying to help out with was school supplies and backpacks. So the mission committee met on Thursday, and we decided we were going to try to make an all-out effort to get some backpacks here. So if you are out shopping and you see backpacks on sale, excuse me, or school supplies, please feel free to pick those up and bring them to us, and we will get them delivered to Brooklyn. Thank you. While Pat's coming up, I just want to add that you can also give funds for that. Um, uh, you can write a check or go to the website and um, designate uh, for missions. And we will use those. We can buy backpacks in bulk. So we can get them for probably a lot cheaper than you can uh, get on your own. But also sometimes it's fun to shop. So whatever way you like to do, uh, we would love your help. This is the Sunday you've been waiting for. You get to make all sorts of noise in church. Yay! Okay, look around in the pews. I emptied all my bins that I could put out everything I have that makes noise. So look around. If you don't have anything close to you, look around to another pew. And if you can't find one, um, there are always body, you know, body instruments. Okay, everybody get an instrument. Or, oh yeah, we have the the... Uh, streamers too in there. Let's have a dry run, okay? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, oh gosh, <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> okay, now, you can only do this at a certain time. Uh, the middle of the sermon is probably not the best time to do it, okay? The middle of the scripture, probably not. But if the spirit so moves you, you know, Brian. <laughs> you know, Brian. Okay, so we're going to do this two times. Um, right after the statement of faith, we will do, you know, when we sing amen. And guys, don't forget your, you know what? Sing it over. That's right. I didn't hear a whole lot of that last week. So don't forget to add that part too. So you can sing and play at the same time on that one. And then the very last hymn, it, well, it's not really a hymn, it's a song. Um, I danced in the morning. I can't think of the rest of it. 
Lord of the Dance, thank you. We've only sung it 400 times in choir. Lord of the Dance, that's the one that I would love to just raise this roof off of here. I want them to hear us on Taylorsville Road and think, what is going on in that church, okay? All right, I'll be listening. Thanks. <laughs> Friends, let us answer the call to worship the God who brings peace that passes understanding. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you are the reason that we gather together today. Open our hearts so that we may feel your spirit and fill our souls with a radical joy that makes us want to dance and sing. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let us worship God in song. Please remain standing. Um, as uh, Pastor Rachel mentioned, today is the first day of General Synod, and one of the ways that the United Church of Christ comes together is in by reciting the Statement of Faith, uh, which can be found um, in the back of your hymnal or on the screen. So please join me. We believe in God, the Eternal Spirit, who is made known to us in Jesus our brother and to whose deeds we testify. God calls the worlds into being, creates humankind in the divine image, and sets before us the ways of life and death. God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. God judges all humanity and all nations by that will of righteousness declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, a crucified and risen Lord, God has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death, and reconciling the whole creation to its creator. God bestows upon us the Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. God promises to all who trust in the gospel, forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, Courage in the struggle for justice and peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in that kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto God. 
Amen. Spirit's moving now. Here we go. What a good time for a prayer of confession. <laughs> In fact, it is a good time for a prayer of confession because this is the moment that we clear away those things that are keeping us from fully dancing. And so let us pray together. God, when the trials and tribulations of life take hold of us, we lift our eyes to you. It's during these difficult times in the human experience that we sometimes find ourselves with feelings of guilt or being unworthy of your love. But we are reminded, God, that nothing can separate us from your love. You who made the earth and the heavens are our keeper and our shade. In you, we find an everlasting love that shines within our hearts. We can take all comfort, we can all take comfort in knowing your dedication to loving and caring for us and your eternal and unconditional gift of grace is a reminder of your covenant to us. In the name of Christ Jesus, we know your plans of everlasting peace for us in your kingdom to come. Amen. Friends, God is merciful and pours out God's love on us abundantly. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and free to dance. In the presence of God, we dance with joy. Hallelujah and Amen. Good morning. I am, I am so thrilled to see so many faces in the pews and our young adults. Bonus. <laughs> All right, let's see. I am reading the scripture, which is um, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 19. This tells the story of David bringing the sacred chest to Jerusalem. And the sacred chest, also known as the Ark of the Covenant, held the two flat stones with the Ten Commandments written on them. It's a bit of a story, so settle in. <laughs> I'm reading from the contemporary English version. So here we go. David brought together 30,000 of Israel's best soldiers and led them to Bala in Judah, which was also called Kiriath Jerem. They were going there to get the sacred chest and bring it back to Jerusalem. The throne of the Lord all powerful is above the winged creatures on top of this chest, and he is worshiped there. 
They put the sacred chest on a new ox cart and started bringing it down the hill from Abinadab's house. Abinadab's sons, Uzzah and Ahio, were guiding the ox cart with Ahio walking in front of it. Some of the people of Israel were playing music on small harps and other stringed instruments and on tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. David and the others were happy and they danced for the Lord with all their might. But when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, the oxen stumbled. So Uzzah reached out and took hold of the sacred chest. The Lord God was very angry at Uzzah for doing this and he killed Uzzah right there beside the chest. David got angry at God for killing Uzzah. He named that place bursting out against Uzzah and that's what it's still called. David was afraid of the Lord and thought, should I really take the sacred chest to my city? He decided not to take it there Instead, he turned off the road and took it to the home of Obed-Edom, who was from Gath. The chest, the chest stayed there for three months, and the Lord greatly blessed Obed-Edom, his family, and everything he owned. Then someone told King David, the Lord has done this because the sacred chest is in Obed-Edom's house. Right away, David went to Obed-Edom's house to get the chest and bring it back to David's city. Everyone was celebrating. The people carrying the chest walked six steps, then David sacrificed an ox and a choice cow. He was dancing for the Lord with all his might, but he wore only a linen cloth. He and everyone else were celebrating by shouting and blowing horns while the chest was being carried along. Saul's daughter, Michal, looked out her window and watched the chest being brought into David's city. But when she saw David jumping and dancing for the Lord, she was disgusted. They put the chest inside a tent that David had set up for it. David worshiped the Lord by sacrificing animals and burning them on an altar. Then he blessed the people in the name of the Lord All-Powerful. He gave all the men and women in the crowd a small loaf of bread, some meat, and a handful of raisins, and everyone went home.
I'll take that one. You want two of those? And I'll take this too. Well, I'm holding on You know, that one has been more out of church than in church his whole life. So uh, it's, uh, it's, the transition is hard, right? Yeah. All right. Well, friends, would you pray with me? God, as we rejoice to dance with you, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, even our toe-tapping feet, be in line with your rhythm and your music. Amen. Well, this is a doozy of a passage, but it has some wonderful things that I think we need to hear about dancing in the spirit of the Lord. It is something to be done with great delight and something to be done with care as well. You may not know um, that I have often been a wannabe dancer. I'm supremely jealous of Jenna getting to do that uh, for a career. Um, and when I was in Berea, it's a big dancing culture. And so we got to um, learn a little bit more about actual dance. And one of the things that I learned, and this was particularly in Contra and English country dancing, which are those, you know, those things in the Victorian uh, period movies, you know, where they're all moving in circles and twisting around and all that. One of the things I learned was the power of being a good follower. You don't get to control the dance. You don't get to make the decisions about when you're going to turn but you also can't have just limp arms. You can't just sit there. You have to be poised and ready to follow the cue of the leader. You have to have a little bit of tension, of give and take ready in order to be a good dancer. The culmination of my dancing career uh, was, and I say was, I've had a back injury since then, so this was probably the culmination of my dancing career, um, was in 2014 um, when the community of Berea had a community-wide fundraiser that was Dancing with the Stars. Now, you know how small the town is when the associate pastor of the church is considered a star. But they let me in, and by golly, I never worked so hard at anything in my life. It was deeply discouraging and embarrassing many, many times. I fell, I twisted things, uh, I spent a lot of time with ice and my friend ibuprofen. But there was this one day, thankfully the day before the competition, when things sort of fell into place when suddenly I wasn't busy trying to count and think about where all of my limbs were, but I was just moving with the music and in the flow. It was a joyous experience. And the icing on the cake, we won. <laughs> my partner and I were the stars of Berea for 10 minutes. Uh, 
And here's my trophy to prove it. There's also a YouTube video if you, uh, if you ever are so, or a Facebook video if you're ever so inclined. But it was a beautiful feeling to just be in the mix of it. There's the adrenaline and the physical activity and just being part of something greater than yourself. It's a kind of worship. The first times with that new kind of dance are always so hard. But once you get to that click, that alignment with the power of the leader, then you get to flow in the music. Agnes DeMille, the founder of the American Ballet Theater and also famous dancer, choreographer, stage director, philanthropist, author, like just all around amazing person, has this quote that feels really relevant to me. She said, to dance is to be out of yourself, larger, more beautiful, more powerful. This is power. It is glory on earth, and it is yours for the taking. That phrase, glory on earth, is where the dancing of this story, I think, uh, becomes such a powerful image. It's a weird story. The assigned reading for today from the revised common lectionary omits the most dramatic and frightening part, the death of Uzzah. But in so doing, it sanitizes the wild and unpredictable nature of the story, of God in the story. Most of you probably don't remember your Sunday school class with Miss Jean, where you went through the whole uh, experience of uh, David's story. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap. Um, David was the shepherd boy who became the king uh, of Judah, which was the southern part of the Hebrew people. It was divided into two kingdoms at the time. He married the king of the other kingdom, Israel. His name was Saul. So Saul's daughter was David's wife, Michal. And, she, and he also had an extremely close relationship to Saul's son, Jonathan. They even made a covenant in which they talked about loving each other more than uh, they loved women. So Saul starts to get nervous. That's the king of Israel. And he thinks that David is trying to steal his throne and Michal, his wife, intervenes and ends up saving his life and getting him to flee the country. So he's off in exile for a while. And a few years later, Jonathan, David's beloved friend, and Saul are both killed in battle. And after some strife and an interim king that didn't go so well, uh, David is brought back and crowned as the king of both Israel and Judah. This becomes the united monarchy. It is the beginning of the golden age of Israel. In celebration of this moment, David decides to move the capital city from Hebron in the south to Jerusalem, the sort of midway point, as a way to establish this new united monarchy. And that's where we come into the story today. The great dance that David is doing as our reading begins is to celebrate his victory in war and to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the chest of God's uh, holy throne, into a tent that has been built on the top of Mount Zion, where it will serve all of his political purposes and make the kingdom perfect forever. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with cymbals and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets. Here was the victor, the ordained head of the new state, proudly celebrating through dance and song. Now the ark, as you may or may not remember, we had an illustration of it carried by some of our children who are much larger now than they were in those pictures. The ark was a delicate, ornate, and holy box that was so sacred that it could not be touched by human hands. And everybody knew that. That was like a rule you knew, you know, just like the, the fork is on the left and all that. The ark was also known as the mercy seat, and it was thought of partly as the throne of God, even though it was 
sort of more, it was got like God's chair, even though you couldn't see God sitting on it. And its presence signified the presence of God. It was the location of God's glory on earth. The ark was so holy that it could only be carried by poles that were attached by rings. That was the divine order. But for the journey to Zion, David and his crew had an idea of how to make it easier. They put it on a brand new ox cart. And you can imagine that this was done with the greatest of intentions, but it was also done against the orders of God. And that's where poor Uzzah got in trouble. A human carried ark would have been able to be steadied by priests who could move along with the rough terrain, but the ox cart tipped. And when Uzzah reached out to save it, he was zapped dead by an angry God. This, as you might imagine, was a bit of a record scratch in the dance music. Nothing like a dead body to put a damper on the party. This act was so fearsome, so unfathomable, that the procession to Zion stopped. David instead got incredibly angry at God in both fear and retribution and shipped the ark off not to an Israelite neighbor, but a Philistine's house. Take that, God. It remained with the Philistines for a good three months. But interestingly, they found themselves in great prosperity. They had all sorts of wonderful things happen to them, and David thought, <clears throat> maybe I made a mistake. So he goes back to the Philistines and said, you know what, I'm going to take that back. And he marches it this time with human priests carrying it properly back to the Mount of Zion. What you don't get if you omit the story of Uzzah is the shift in what happens in the dancing. The first dancing is that of the victorious king who thinks he's got all the power in the world in this little box. The dance on the way up the mountain the second time is that of a humble servant. His dancing is jubilant but it is more worshipful. It is more based in gratitude. He makes a sacrifice of an ox and a cow every six steps. I don't know exactly how long the journey is, but that's a lot of sacrifice. He did not wear the, war, the armor of a war victor or a king, but instead he wore the garments of a priest, a linen ephod. And he acted as a priest when they got to the top of the mountain, making even more sacrifices and then offering a great feast of food to all the people of Jerusalem. In the second dance, David lets God lead. He follows with all of his strength, but he knows this time who is in control of the dance. The usual interpretation of David's wife, Michal, sort of watching in disgust from afar, is that he's dancing in something that's a little bit too revealing. But that is only one possible translation. Another possible translation is that he is dancing in the garment of someone who is humble, someone who recognizes that God is king and he is under that. He is not dressing as the stately king that Michal's father was, but instead a humble priest. He was violating the court rules by recognizing that the presence of God in the ark was not a trophy of war, but the source of all life. As David continues, the ark is placed in the Holy of Holies inside the tent that David had constructed for it. And he continually prays there for the rest of his rule. Now, astute readers of the Bible will know that David was not always aligned with God's will and that when he got off track, people continued to get hurt. And his story is one of learning to dance with God and to let God lead. In this moment of this story, David gets the dance right. He aligns himself with the rhythm of God. He lets God lead 
and moves in the place of the follower. And in that position, he can leap and dance with joy, losing himself in the glory of a God who is greater than any political kingdom, who demands allegiance above any state. Anyone who has done the hard work of ministry knows that it can go off the rails easily. Trying to keep ourselves aligned with God's joy and dance turns out to be hard work, taking lots of practice and often involving missteps. And that's why I didn't want to take out the story of Uzzah, as awful as it is. I don't know what to do with the image of a God who smites in anger at such a well-intentioned thing. But I also think it's an important warning not to sugarcoat the danger of the worshiping work that we do. If we ever forget, as people of God dancing in the spirit, who is leading, we can do serious damage and people can be hurt. I've seen it happen many times when folks get so focused on the rules of faith and who's in and who's out or try to turn it into a prospering business or a good luck charm, people can be so hurt by these actions that they can die. If you forget that the glory of God is not an object to be manipulated or a commodity you can own or something that you can contain in a building or a flag or even a hymn or a sermon, if you forget that the glory of God is the leader and you are the follower, it can go awry. But in those times, when he was aligned with his faith convictions, when he was feeling the rhythm of being in the arms of God, in those times, David was able to dance with the God who brought him, to follow where God led with respect and without trying to use God as his, his personal magic wand. In those times, David danced with pure joy. On Friday, I got to see the Ark of the Covenant in a tent on West Jefferson and 12th Street right here in Louisville. I got to be present at the dedication of Molo Village, the nearly 10-year initiative of St. Peter's United Church of Christ with its many, many partners, including the wider United Church of Christ, the city of Louisville, all kinds of funders and investors. This project, as many of you know, was the vision of the Reverend Dr. James Etta Ferguson, St. Peter UCC's pastor who preached for us in February, to create a place of development for the long-suffering Russell neighborhood in Louisville. Russell is primarily black and almost entirely poor, and it is a victim of redlining and interstate development and intentional disinvestment for decades. Reverend Ferguson's battles were many, with the city, with zoning laws, with investors. She had to stay true to the vision that had been given to her on a pilgrimage, pilgrimage to South Africa, where she learned that Molo means welcome home. She returned home to her neighborhood, Russell, and began to prepare a place for the glory of the Lord to be seen on earth. Almost 10 years later, under a tent in the hot sun, politician after politician, many of whom had been roadblocks, and board members and investors and UCC members praised Dr. Ferguson. But when it was finally her turn to speak, she gave the glory entirely to God. It was only through her faith that she was able to come this far. God was the lead. She was the faithful and strong-armed follower. And do you know how they blessed that land on Friday? With dancing. You know, we tend to give liturgical dance a bad rap. But in this context, it was truly a prayer of gratitude, of joy, and relief. It was a way of pure rejoicing, of being in the moment of the spirit, of marking the spot where God was present. And then they made sure everyone had a feast. After the dedication was two days of festival, food trucks, bouncy houses, carnival rides, music, more food. It was burnt offerings of funnel cake and popcorn. Sacrifices of song, dance, and laughter. It was joy. It was glory on earth. 
We all have opportunities to make David and Uzzah's mistake. We all have the chance to think that God works for us. We all have the opportunity to say, look at our beautiful building. Look at these beautiful people. Look at this great technology. But if we ever forget that those things are but pointers to the presence of God, we will go awry. If we ever get so focused on them that we forget to follow God's lead, if we try to make the journey easier with a cart instead of the difficult but steadier work of the people holding the poles together, we risk tripping and falling. Let us never forget that the glory of God is not in the bricks and the mortar, but in the mouths of the hungry needing to be fed. It alights on the backs of the foster children needing backpacks and notes of encouragement as they seek education and healing from trauma. It is in the small crack of light in the dark chamber of mental illness. It is the dance of the one who was thought to be dead and now is alive. There is the glory on earth. And let us never forget that the generosity required of us to give of ourselves and to humble ourselves is what leads to us being able to participate in the dance. Without it, we will miss the flow and the joy and the ecstasy of God's rhythm. Dancing with the holy takes work, and we will mess up for certain. But if we keep our eyes focused on the glory on earth, on the lead of the God of love, on the essence of the dance, on the pulse of love pounding in our eardrums, we will get to dance. And there might be funnel cakes, too. Let's dance, friends. Thank you, Pastor Rachel. So now we're going to move into our call to offering. Um, and I was looking for a bit of scripture for this morning, and I found something that I really like that I think resonates given the sermon and the announcements that we've had. Uh, this is from Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesy, prophesying, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And if it's dancing, do it with abandon. I added that part. <laughs> uh, if you would like to make a, a monetary gift to you, Emmanuel United Church of Christ, uh, you can mail your contribution to the church. There is also an offering plate in the narthex, or you can give by going to emmanuelucc.info and click on the button donate here. Friends, let us pray together. And those of you who are joining us online on Zoom, if you have prayer concerns that you want to add to the chat, we invite you to do that now. Lord of the dance, you have breathed into us your creative, joyful spirit. You have lifted us from the dust into the swirling joy of your presence. We are so grateful for all that you have done for us. 
Each day reminds us in many ways of your mercy and your love. For those times ahead that we feel like we can't quite get the rhythm, or we're out of breath from effort and practice feels fruitless, help us feel the beat in our bones. Rejuvenate us with joy, always focused in gratitude for your grace. We ask your blessing especially upon those in our hearts who need your special care. Teresa, and Lauren, Anne, Billy, Vicki, our beloveds in nursing and senior facilities, Jane, Mary Ellen, Betty, Florence, Julia, Bill and Gail. All these and so many more that are in our hearts and you know, oh God. We lift to you as we pray to you as Jesus taught us. Coming to you as our maker, our mother, and our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go from here, let your body feel the rhythm of love and life and dance even if it's awkward. Know that it is the spirit of God that moves your feet, the redemptive Christ who leaps up even from the cross for a dance of life and the creator who places the beat even in our very hearts. You will not be dancing alone, but with the whole universe. So dance then, wherever you may be this week. Dance to the beat of love. Go in peace.